such vivid, vivid reasons uh, for why we get together. Uh, tell you what gives me hope, and that's being on the same team with Ted and uh, Alex Bryan and the rest of you. Uh, yeah, it's been really good to be here this morning. Um, good morning uh, to all of you who want to get started here. So if I can invite you back to your seats. I, I, I started to think to myself, this is a large room. And it's not as full as it was. And so maybe those who are a little on the outside, if you want to come a little bit closer, I'll be honest with you, uh, Dr. Lampkin and uh, Dr. Delion, our presentation yesterday was quite different. Was anyone, let me see how many hands, how many people were in the presentation yesterday with us upstairs? Anyone? No. Okay. So, okay. I see one. Um, it was really engaging. Um, and I should say that that's what we actually want to do. We want to invite uh, space for conversation. So. Um, let me begin just really quickly here while we're waiting for um, our other half. My name is Francisco Cross. I am the director for mission and spiritual care um, at Adventist Health and Right Out. And so I'm happy to say, I don't know if Alex is still here, Alex um, uh, and uh, uh, Joyce, um, we are on the same team. Um, and so always just so great to work with him. Um, uh, oh, there he is, Alex, just giving a shout out to our to our West Coast team with Adventist Health. Um, we're actually going to be talking about uh, enlivening your ethics committee. And, and I will say this shortly before I introduce um, both of these uh, esteemed colleagues and friends of mine. Um, it has been a privilege to actually uh, start an ethics committee um, at Right Out. Um, Dr. Gerald Winslow and Dr. Grace Wee and even Dr. Gina Moore uh, were so gracious to come up and to, to actually take the time to help build um, our ethics committee, uh, in which we're proud to say that we've been doing over 100 ethic consults um, and excited about that. But it has been a journey, um, Dr. Winslow, um, as everything that we do is, right? Um, um, let me go on ahead and I want to introduce, I told Andy this morning that uh, when I woke up, it hit me. Uh, I have an eight month old at home. And so not only is my three hour jet lag caught up to me, but usually around two and four in the morning, I'm holding him while my wife is resting. So my clock is all over the place this morning, but I said, I'm here. So I'm actually going to read um, the bios this morning because I want to make sure that I stay uh, on track if that's okay. Um, Dr. Dennis DeLeon is a family and medicine physician who has served as a chief medical officer in three large healthcare systems in the Los Angeles and Seattle area before joining Adventist Health in 2018. He completed his medical training at the University of Tennessee. Following residency at Loma Linda University, Dennis had the privilege of studying clinical medical ethics at the University of Chicago. He helped establish the first clinical ethics consultation service at Loma Linda in the early 1990s. I didn't know that. That's actually quite amazing. And Dennis works as the chief medical officer right here at Adventist Health Kissimmee and co-chairs the Biomedical Ethics Committee at Adventist Health Orlando. He is the father of three teenagers and one Maltese puppy, and he loves cycling. <clears throat> Andy. I want to begin by saying this. I said it yesterday, and I'll say it again. He has been, we've known each other now for 20, 20 plus years. For he first met me, I first met him when I was just a lad at Oakwood University. Just a lad trying to find his way. And I found my way, but I found my way largely because of black men in my life, my father, and people like Andy who have taken the time to really mentor me professionally. Um, personally, my personal life. And so I just want to say thank you, Dr. Andy Lampkin, for sharing that. It's an honor and privilege to share this space with you. But let me just, uh, for those of you who don't know him, I do want to do just serve justice and read to you a little bit about Andy. Andy Lampkin is native of Chicago, Chi Town. Yeah. Hello. Woo -woo. Yeah, we got a little shout out over there, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and he's taught uh, theology and bioethics um, for over two decades. Um, he completed his undergraduate work at Oakwood, um, our alma mater, university, and earned his master's, um, his master's and doctorate of philosophy from Vanderbilt University. We have a few of those uh, in the house. Um, Dr. Lampkin is a professor of religion at Advent Health University in Orlando, Florida. As the engaged scholar, in addition to his teaching responsibilities at Adventist Health University, he serves at Adventist Health, at Advent Health, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused, they're so close, at Advent Health, um, 
Dr. Lambton is a minister who loves to do what he does, and you'll see that. And I hope that today um, you are inspired by what they are going to share. Um, Dr. DeLeon, you said it, and I'm going to turn the mic over to you all. Um, ethics is already happening. Ethics happens where ethics happens. It's a very raw and natural conversation that's happening already with many of you. Uh, I don't know how many chaplains we have in the house. I know we have a lot of administration, but ethics is already happening. So we hope that as you're hearing kind of uh, this, this, um, this informative, engaging uh, conversation, that you're empowered to know that you already are a part of those conversations. And maybe if you haven't started an ethics committee, or maybe if you're not sitting on an ethics committee, you can truly, truly be encouraged to know that today, after this, uh, you'll have some skill sets and some knowledge that will take you there. So, Dr. DeLeon. Cisco, thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction and setting us up. And um, you, you couldn't have said any better. Um, ethics, uh, today we're talking about ethics committees, and um, we will focus quite a bit on um, how an ethics committee gets started if you don't already have one, um, what that beginning might look like, what the beginning, the middle, and the mature stage of an ethics committee uh, looks like. Um, but uh, a good place to start is to remember exactly what you said, Cisco, because an ethics committee is but one place where ethics might happen. And in all likelihood, whether you have an active ethics committee or not, Ethics is going on at your facility, at your institution right now already, and it's going on in places that you may not, we may not remember and imagine that it is. So if you have a physician's lounge uh, where docs get together to eat, there's ethics going on there. There's conversations, there's dialogue, there's agonizing colleague to colleague, uh, um, comparing of notes, that is everything that we're going to cover today as ethics activity, that's happening. Um, if you have um, colleagues, multidisciplinary physicians, nurses, chaplains, social workers, case managers making rounds on a unit where terminal, terminally ill patients are being cared for, ethics is going on in those rounds, whether we call it that formally or recognize it as such, or whether we don't happen to. Um, ethics can be going on in the parking lot, chatter, right? After a long shift and um, nurses are huddling, comparing notes, um, commiserating, ethics is going on in many, many places. Ethics is going on in the executive boardroom where struggles might be happening that we call under other names, but their ethics, right? But one of the things that, one of the goals we can set for ourselves, if we happen to be fortunate enough to be starting an ethics committee or restarting, re-enlivening one, that'll be a big topic for the next few minutes, is to identify those other loci of ethics activity, Cisco. Remember that what might be going on there, find allies in those areas, bring them out of the shadows, if you will, and maybe incorporate them into what we're going to call a more formal structure, right? And that formal structure, if you look at the literature of ethics committees, classically there are three functions. And all of you in this room uh, know this already, but it's worthwhile reminding ourselves that education is maybe top of the list. Probably should be at the top of the list of our bullet points here. Uh, policy, uh, reviewing the policies we've got perhaps even drafting, writing new ones, tweaking, improving the ones we have is the second big function. And the third one, case consultation. And oftentimes, especially when you have clinical people asking you to form an ethics committee or driving for the formation of an ethics committee, what they're asking for is case consultation. It is maybe the most active outward facing activity, but there's a lot else that must still go on and has to really precede case consultation. Um, and one of the things that's got to start the whole ball game is needs assessment, right? And um, uh, if you were here yesterday and you heard Dr. Edwin Hernandez um, promoting a study that he and his team are about to publicize, um, what he is, what he and his team have done spectacularly well, is a very, very sophisticated needs assessment, not just of one department or hospital, but Advent Health. 50-something hospitals, 
eight states, um, and building on work done by our very own Ted Hamilton a decade ago by yourself, Ted, I think. Uh, and um, that was needs assessment. It's basically asking a question. When people are asking for ethics activity, ethics committee, what is it that they need? What do they already have that they may or may not know they've got, right? So um, let me hand the mic back over to uh, you, Andy. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate you, uh, Dennis. I, I want to say so much about Francisco, but we really need to focus on this presentation. But those professors in the room, you, you know it when you see it, those really bright students. I, I forgot where you grew up, but you showed up at Oakwood College sitting in the back of the classroom, just so engaging. He was one of those students we know would do very well, and we are so, 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 so proud of you, brother. Um, so, Dennis, you set it up fine. Thank you so much. And so right now we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, do it, taking an inventory of the ethics resources. So if you're thinking about starting an ethics committee or reestablishing uh, an, an ethics committee, you have to take a look at your institution. Take a look at the people uh, around you as you think about uh, reforming the committee, reestablishing the committee and the like. And so we just have a list of the type of individuals you might want to consider as you think about reestablishing or establishing an ethics committee from uh, start. First thing, think about people who work on, work or deal with ethical issues. Again, Dennis talked about it. Francisco talks, talked about it. Ethics is happening all around us all the time. You know, people are engaged in ethical issues. And so, hey, who's talking about the ethical issues in your uh, community or the, the institution that you serve in? Uh, you're quite for fortunate if you have a professional with uh, ethics training, if you have a physician like Dr. DeLeon, who not only has a medical degree, but also has you know, graduate level training in ethics, that's the gold standard. Standard. You hit gold uh, there because, of course, they get the medicine. Absolutely, that's the case. But they also understand how to think very carefully and critically uh, about uh, ethical issues. And so if you have those people in your community, you're doing extremely well. Uh, nurses do amazing work as it relates to ethics. Chaplains and spiritual care, they, they ought to be on the committee somewhere. Uh, philosophers, and we could talk a lot about philosophers and theologians. Uh, there are several uh, in the room. They can serve very, very well on uh, ethics committees. We can sometimes be frustrating, right, Dr. Winslow, because we tend to slow things down or we want to slow things down. And uh, I know uh, our ethics committee, and I see Francis Nash, we meet right there in the middle of the day at noon, and we go for an hour and a half, and uh, the busy docs, the nurses, everyone, they have to get back to their work. And so they don't have a lot of time to slow things. We don't often have a lot of time just to go really slow at the pace of philosophers and theologians. But again, philosophers and theologians, they tend to slow things down, but they ask good questions. Hopefully we're asking good questions, probing kind of questions. Thank you for sharing. Goes without saying. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, uh, physicians serve very, very well on ethics committee. They ought to be on ethics committees. Absolutely. Uh, oftentimes we would commend that the physician, a physician should be the chair of the ethics committee, and we're going to talk about that in greater greater detail. In a company like Avent Health, where we say look at the local resources, but also think about the regional resources. So although you may not have some of these resources that we lift right here in your, at your institution or in your community, there may be someone around that you can pick up the phone and uh, call. I don't see Alfred uh, here in Chicago. From time to time, he picks up the phone and he gives me a call. We're dealing with this case because you did. Thank you so much. Uh, and help us think through it. Let's take a little time and help us think through this case. We're a thousand miles away, but you can pick up the phone or we can do a Zoom call and we can engage in these issues a little bit. We're going to turn our attention to the profile of ethics committees. We captured a little bit the membership here, what the membership should 
uh, look like. For the sake of time, Dennis, we're going to ask you to talk about the structure and the leadership piece. Sure. Yeah. So um, you, you have a couple of choices structurally for an ethics committee. And um, one is to make it primarily an administrative committee of a hospital. And uh, by that, I mean it's um, open to a wide range of hospital employees and staff. Um, usually there's a, a membership um, that your charter specifies for a community member or a contributor. Um, but the accountability is largely to the administrative leadership of the hospital. It could be the chief operating officer or the CEO. Um, and that, uh, that has a bunch of uh, structural advantages um, because the accountability goes to somebody who's the boss of the hospital. Um, there's also the option of making the committee largely a medical staff committee, meaning that it is um, appointed by um, a election or appointment amongst the physicians who voluntarily practice at that hospital and who are their own legal entity, right? And um, there are advantages that come with that. And one of the ones, as I'm sitting here looking at our uh, executive director, Francis Nash, is the fact that a medical staff committee can structure itself so that it is, is protected legally um, with a status called um, patient safety work product status. And so that simply means that work done in that committee, charts reviewed there, confidential medical facts um, looked at, um, are all in the service of patient quality and safety and therefore enjoy in most states a legal protection from legal discovery by attorneys, including plaintiff's attorneys who might be seeking um, adversarial action against hospital or physicians, right? And so there is a protection. Now, that protection is, in, especially in Florida, somewhat debatable and tenuous and uh, under uh, some scrutiny and attack even, but um, what protection there is, is becomes available to you if your committee is structured as a med staff committee. And then there's a combination, which is a hybrid, and that is to make it a, both an administrative committee with administrative accountability and a medical staff committee, which is accountable to the elected chief of staff physician. And um, most models I've seen that work really well and stand the test of time are, in fact, hybrids. Um, so um, that's important, and much can be said about that, and the literature has got a lot of contributions for you if you're more interested in that. Um, I was wondering, just going back, to Cisco, you are the guy with the experience, recent experience, building up a committee in a, you know, about 180-bed hospital in rural Northern California. As you recruited folks, were you able to find the kind of um, talent that you know, Andy referred to in the last slide? No, th thank you for, for inviting me to, to be a part of this conversation. That was actually one of the challenges that we had, and I've said this in so many ways, coming from a, a LLUH, Loma Linda University Health System, um, to a small rural uh, a, a community, Marysville, California, just north of Sacramento. Um, our resources were a little on the lower end. But what I will say, and you said it so eloquently yesterday, is that ethics is already happening. The conversation is already happening. So my task was to really seek out those individuals who already had the passion and the heart for being a part of these conversations and essentially being an advocate. Um, and so we ended up using kind of that hybrid approach uh, that Dr. Grace Wee um, shared in her presentation uh, where we really felt that um, because of the, the, the population that we were in, a third of population seek, uh, a, a lot of our uh, physicians who were contracted out, it, it, was, it was this paradigm shift where Adventist Health was just actually marrying right out. And so not only were we starting an ethics committee, but we were actually uh, learning to now give birth to this culture being a faith-driven organization. And so, again, we had those people already, and so we picked a multi-interdisciplinary team that included uh, our chief medical officer, who happened to be um, the, 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 the chief, um, a chief champion administrator representative, along with all the other, the case management, the social worker, and the chaplain. I think that is where we found that there was a unique conversation that we had because, again, because of the lack of resources, there were many who weren't used to having those very difficult conversations, and so we did a lot of emphasis and how do we have these very challenging uh, conversations and how do we bring everyone together to be a part of this movement? Um, just to 
you asked about chairmanship of the committee, right? And so in our hybrid model here at Advent Health Orlando, Francis, um, I think you helped set this up. Uh, we have uh, two, uh, co chairs, actually, a pair of co chairs, and one is an administrator that happens to be me. Um, I'm a physician not currently practicing, and the um, clinical co chairperson is um, one of our longtime surgeons here, Dr. Joe Portuguese, um, who uh, represents the medical staff and is also a medical staff officer. So the accountability, I think, um, effectively goes um, in two ways, for the good of us all, I think. You actually captured that point about identifying the leadership roles. I will ask you to speak a little bit more on that. But when we think about establishing a, an ethics committee, ideally the committee should represent the community that you're actually called to serve. We believe that in the literature actually suggests that. So when you look around your community, your committee, your committee should look like the community that you're actually serving. Uh, it's good to have a mix of professional lay, ethnic racial, as well as uh, religious and socioeconomic diversity on uh, the committee. We had a lot of discussion around this uh, yesterday, actually, some of the challenges that come with that. And as you can imagine, there's some challenges there. But again, ideally, if you can have that kind of representation on your committee, you would be doing very well. Because all of those individuals will bring different perspectives, different perspectives to uh, the ethical issues or the uh, the dilemmas that surface in the clinical encounter. And again, the role of our hospitals, the role of our institutions and community is to serve those communities and our communities are diverse. And so our committees and our institutions and its leadership ought to be uh, diverse as well. Cisco, I'll, I'll just give you an example that uh, you gave in your hospital that you talked about in Northern California. There's a large Sikh population. You know, when we think about religious diversity, most of us are very comfortable with the, the various Christian denominations. We're even comfortable with our Muslim neighbors and, and, and friends, of course, our Jewish friends. But when you start talking about uh, the Sikh religion and some of the Eastern religions, we're not as familiar. But they have perspectives. They have ideas. And we want to hear all of those ideas, ideas about when does life begin. And we're going to talk about that. And when does life uh, end. And the ethical issues... You have to bring all of that kind of moral rigor, that's what we call it, that moral rigor to bear as you think about those issues. Do you want to say a few more words about uh, the identity of the, the various leadership's role, or are you comfortable with you, what you cover? I think we're good. Okay. Can give us some insights into the East Orlando uh, experience and all we just left. Right. Yeah. So, um, one, um, Dr. Simmons was here with us a moment ago. He's the uh, was the chief medical officer at our East Orlando uh, facility, Advent Health. It's just maybe eight or ten miles uh, east of where we are right now, and um, uh, historically an osteopathic hospital, um, maybe in the uh, size range of 300 beds or so. Um, and um, an interesting thing happened a few years ago, um, and that is that a uh, a subgroup of physicians, mostly hospitalists, internists, a couple of ED docs, were struggling with um, what amounted really to ethical issues, although it wasn't really recognized as such early on, but issues with the patient population that they saw coming through their ED, um, a preponderance of, of folks who were uh, had substance abuse problems, um, opioid addiction, some of which was... Um, uh, iatrogenic or physician caused. Um, there were also struggles with um, psych, psychiatric comorbidities, uh, patients who had eating disorders or suicidality that manifested in, uh, in um, very, very dramatic ways that were impacting the community. And the patients who ended up admitted um, faced ethical problems. Their teams faced ethical problems around when do we accede to someone's uh, refusal to not uh, refusal to be fed artificially they have an eating disorder right when what's the line between competency and incompetency for someone who is uh, has a severe eating disorder life threatening um, how do we handle um, the un unfriended patient who is terminal 
because of um, an event related to their opioid addiction. They have perhaps friends in the community. No one's willing to be the decision maker. Um, and these docs realized we would love to have an ethics committee. And they approached um, several of us, including Jason Hines and Andy Lampkin. And I was a little bit chagrined because I actually uh, was the um, co-chair of the system-wide ethics committee. And you know, I was kind of kind of their guy for that. And um, that question kind of was filtered to me through other folks. And I thought to myself, well, you have an ethics committee, but it's at the big hospital 10 miles away. And you probably don't know that we exist. You probably don't know how to access our services. And that made me uh, feel a little self-conscious and realize education was needed. But what happened was the, the team of Jason and Andy and I and Francis um, put together a, a, a curriculum for them over a period of about six months. We um, identified those key <clears throat> clinical leaders and doctors at that hospital. And besides education, we also made rounds with them. We also allowed them to uh, encourage them to observe how ethics consultations are done, not just at their facility, but at others in the system. And they became aware that, wait, wait a minute, we are part of a system that has resources, and now we know, right? Anything you want to add there? Sure. Just, br just briefly, um, the, the, the basic education that was provided to that uh, co committee over those six months, just an orientation to uh, ethics committee work, what ethics work look like in the committee uh, beyond the hallway or again in, in, in the dining uh, hall, for instance, purpose and function of the committee, the various roles and responsibilities of the chair, co-chair, uh, the recorder and the like. And of course, one area that I enjoy tremendously is the basic bioethics uh, education, just giving them a glimpse into uh, what bioethics uh, is and the kind of discussions that are had in uh, bioethics, what it looks like more uh, formally. Dennis did a, a marvelous job on giving us insights into clinical ethics. So bioethics and then clinical uh, ethics, bioethics can be very theoretical, but clinical ethics, of course, is trying to put it on the ground and relate to the issues that the providers are actually uh, facing. Some discussion, we had a good bit of discussion around the typical cases that I reviewed. Uh, Dennis talked about uh, the East Orlando context and the types of patients that they see and the experiences of uh, various patients, as you can imagine. Um, those patients show up with their issues, with their uh, concerns, and sometimes you see typical cases. And so we gave some insights into the very, very typical cases that we often see. Um, because if you've seen it once, you have some insights into how to think about it. And then some discussion about the institutional uh, values. You know, we are a faith-based uh, institution. And we have to bring our values to bear as we think about our uh, work and what we do. I'm going to move to the curriculum uh, now. Sure. Just a question, just to interject on that slide, too. Um, I love the emphasis that you're putting all this in on training that focus on clinical efforts. Uh, I just want, I want to take a look at the uh, at one of the conferences. Um, uh, no, you're okay. Uh, one of the conferences um, at the ASBH, American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, uh, Penn State, I believe, was given the presentation, and some of you may recall who were there, um, where they did an exercise, and maybe this is something you already do. I know it's something that we do uh, as we're figuring out what discussions should we be having. Um, it was just like this, and they had round tables, and, and what we didn't know is they had a packet flipped upside down where you couldn't see the content, and they said, don't flip it over, don't look at it. But then they did a breakout session, and maybe that's something we can think about doing in an actual presentation. They actually did a breakout session, and what they did is the people sitting at that table, that was your uh, healthcare team, if I can put it that way. And to my surprise, I think I was sitting at a table with CEO and a few other individuals, um, a physician, I think one of them was a, neuros uh, a neuroscientist and uh, a lot of contributions to his hospital. But when we flipped over the packets, they soon found out their script, their role of who they were to be in. One was a, the, 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 the physician was um, the chaplain and, and the other one was a patient. 
And, and, and then we were to role play, Carla. We were to role play. And let me tell you, I was shocked to hear that we had so many years of academic training. Uh, hear, hear, me, hear me clearly. But yet we weren't prepared to have these conversations. And how do we have those conversations? The truth is, for the chaplains, uh, Wookie and some of the others uh, from Oakwood, um, uh, the, con the conversations that we are now faced to have, we can only face them if we're comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's what we've been done. So I love, I love to see that, and maybe that's something we can do. Francisco, bring up a good point. Do you remember, Francis, that we did um, simulations and we did uh, uh, scripted and unscripted conversations in the East Orlando um, curriculum? And it's exactly what you were saying, making, helping clinicians to be more comfortable with the topics they were going to discuss and seeing how you can go right and wrong. Francis. Um, after we shared with them the ethical principles, we also shared with them end-of-life education. It's really important for your ethics committee to know your hospital's policies on withholding withdrawal, DNR. They need to become like the experts. But what was really fun was we did the role plays. We gave everybody um, different who they were. We had an actual case. And this is after um, Dr. DeLeon taught them the uh, we have an ethics decision-making model. We have that four-part section you, you might be familiar with that we use on all our ethics consults. And we, we did that with them because everybody was feeling really nervous. Can I do an ethics consult? But what was amazing was to watch each of them get into their role play, simulate, and then we had part of the group be, be the ethics committee, part be the family. We went through the whole piece. And what was amazing is when they used the ethics decision-making process with the education they learned, they actually came up with really good ethics recommendations that an, any ethics consult would have done. So it was very worthwhile. Very yes. Scary, right? yes. Yeah, it was striking how those doctors came along. And let me tell you, the end of the story is that that committee, that kind of East Orlando subcommittee, does not actually exist today anymore. They don't meet regularly. Uh, they did for a while. They handled the cases that came in, including all the types that I mentioned, you know, severe substance use disorder, um, competency, um, lack of proxy decision makers, et cetera. Um, and you know what they did? They learned a method. And the method they uh, eventually applied organically, intrinsically as part of their rounding. And what I learned and realized as a leader is they were asking me to help them form a committee, but what they wanted was education. That's what they wanted, that's what they needed, that's what they in the end received. And then they realized, oh, we already have this formal structure of a committee. It's over in Orlando. It's the, the, the big system committee, and we don't really need another one. Now that we have this education, we can handle a, a great number of our cases ourselves, and the occasional incredibly challenging, uniquely difficult case, we will call Orlando, right? And we will, uh, the, the big committee will, sometimes we have a formal consultation still there. We, we do quite regularly. So, um, but they learned how to do basic foundational um, everyday ethics on their own, including their own challenging cases that were somewhat unique to their community. Really powerful lesson for us. Thank you. Uh, a little bit more just on the curriculum for ethics uh, committees. Dennis and I, we spent a little time thinking about this and talking about this. If ideally we could pull this off, that would be great as we think about educating uh, ethics committees. And I don't need to go into a lot of detail on any of this. You can see it, but just think about uh, if you provide an instruction to an ethics committee considering what they're going to be doing, what kinds of education, what kinds of insights, what kinds of tools would they uh, need? The moral and ethical foundations of clinical uh, practice, those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about ethics, uh, we would say, Ted, medicine is a moral enterprise. The very nature of it is moral when you stop and reflect on what morality uh, is, life and community. The very nature of it is uh, moral. So you always have to start there. Every time you enter a patient's room, morality is happening. Morality is uh, going on. The history and role of ethics in medicine. I think we missed that piece of talking about how these committees got established. You may want to return uh, to that. Uh, 
They tell it again. Ethics in medicine goes back at least 2,500 years, right, to the whole Hippocratic Oath. We all heard of that. So we've been discussing ethics and morality for, for quite uh, a while. And committees, they don't need a deep dive into that history, but they do need to understand, I think, that history uh, a bit, that we're not creating anything new. The issues constantly change and perhaps get more uh, complex, but not uh, new. Uh, Francis, when you talked, you talked about those basic principles up there. And I think these are the, it's called principalism, the dominant principles in biomedical ethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-malfesis, and uh, justice. But there are other approaches to thinking about bioethical issues. Yuri's shaking his, shaking his head. And they don't often get a lot of attention. You know, institutions, and this is what uh, Dennis was talking about, institutions normally land on an approach, right? And then they just keep working uh, out of that uh, approach. And there's something to that. But it would be wise, I think, to inter at least introduce your committee to various other approaches to thinking about ethical uh, issues. Because uh, some of the tensions that you may experience may, may be experienced because people are thinking about things differently. Individuals are seeing things uh, differently. Ellie's not in the, the room. Narrative ethics, feminist ethics, smart cars not in the room, virtue uh, ethics, pragmatic ethics. These are all various approaches to ethical decision making that's well established in the literature and they're used all across the nation. So they're, they're not odd or extreme approaches. They are approaches that are being uh, use. Ted, you led us in a wonderful discussion on the abortion policy. It just kept coming up. <laughs> so we, in our meeting yesterday, we had a good bit of discussion about that policy. You were there, you were there in the room. Yuri was there uh, in the room. And it was a comment made. Uh, Ali Benitez, Dr. Winslow, you know Ali. Um, she made a profound comment about the, the policy, and I won't go into details of the policy, but Cisco, myself, and uh, Dennis, we sat around and, and we were trying to figure out was it a feminist critique? What? I mean, it was a basic and fundamental critique. It was like, wow, the policy just didn't consider this at all. And we were all kind of paused, right? Wow, that was kind of profound, Allie. Thank you for that. But it was just the way she was thinking uh, about it. She was bringing a particular kind of lens, that's the language we use, a particular kind of lens to uh, the issue. And so we need to be just mindful of that. There are various approaches to thinking about ethical issues. Uh, we all bring our own lens to the issues. Again, and this is why it's extremely important. It's not a luxury to have a very diverse committee bringing those various perspectives to the table. Because at the end of the day, yeah, you make a decision and we all sign off on it. But in ethics, Dr. Winslow would say, at some point, all of your decisions have to be publicly defensible. You may have to explain it. And people may say, did you consider this? Did you consider that? And again, you know, just doing our due diligence, we want to be prepared to uh, be able to have broad and frank discussion about these issues. I see you shaking your head and your hand. Oh my gosh. Well, it was just such a powerful conversation that we had. And one of the points she brought up was the theme of her, the question of what is viability outside the womb in the context of medical innovation, right? Because if there's a lot of interventions that we use to sustain life outside of the womb, so what are we, how do we qualify what is a condition that cannot survive outside of the womb when we consider all the innovations that we have? And that is also going to be something that's going to evolve with time. So ethics also evolves with time, with technology, with all of these other things. And so, again, perspectives that you don't normally hear when you stay on that surface black and white or a specific orientation. If you stay within a specific orientation, it's tidy. And the reality of it is, none of this is tidy. I like that. None of it's tidy. I would say it's not black and white. It's all gray. But I like tidy. That's even better. That's even better language. We should get away from the colorism. That's good. Thank you for, for that. Bottom bullet point. Uh, there are various models and approaches to ethical deliberation, and I would suggest there's no one best 
model. What's up there now? Clinical ethics consultation. Please talk about credentialing a little bit and uh, the various models. Yeah. So um, the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, Francisco, you mentioned them earlier. You're a member. Many in this room are members and leaders. Um, Dr. Grace Wee and others at Loma Linda are, are certified healthcare ethics um, consultants, that's a certification that's become available just in recent years. It is a powerful, powerful tool, highly recommended, um, and the product of incredible design and deliberation over many decades, actually. I'm on a journey to, um, to uh, uh, that certification as well, and many of you, I'm sure, are, and you should seek out people who are um, or are getting certified in those areas because they will have the kind of education um, that uh, speaks to many of the things we've just talked about. So I want to put that plug in for ASBH and for uh, healthcare ethics uh, consult certification. Um, Cisco, you built up a committee that's now doing consultations, and a significant number of them in a fairly, you know, in a medium-sized hospital. Um, there was probably a time when you faced um, some design choices, either consciously or or, or um, not. But um, you had to kind of figure out, was one consultant going to respond to um, a bedside request, go see a patient, talk to a family, convene a meeting? Um, that's very common because, you know, in most places you've only got a handful of people who are trained or comfortable to do a, an ethics consult. Uh, if you've got more than that, you can have a team. You can have a subcommittee um, that, of the main ethics committee. Uh, and oftentimes here at Advent Health Orlando, we have the luxury of doing that. We have two or three people with a lead consultant who writes up the case, uh, if the case ends up being formally written up, and others who support that individual. And um, our particular model um, limits um, notation in the chart to somebody that's approved by the ethics committee. Um, many of those are already physicians who are part of the medical staff. Um, some are not. And as a healthcare ethics consult certification becomes more commonplace, um, your medical staffs may want to look at expanding the, uh, the, the ability of non-physician consultants to write ethics consults into the chart. That's kind of a, a cutting-edge area. Anything you want to say about that, Francis? All right, cool. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where uh, I think where we are headed. Um, but um, that, it depends on your local hospital culture, Francisco. And you have a very definite culture, uh, you know, at uh, Admin Health Rideout. Um, and you may want to say something about how consults so, developed in your I actually have a question for you because Dr. Ellen Fox, and I think it was an article that we looked at uh, from the AMA Journal of Ethics, um, actually, ac actually spoke about a lot of recent concerns about the quality of healthcare uh, ethic consultations. Um, how do we actually uh, evaluate, if I may, how do we evaluate what we're doing? Um, and, and, and are we doing what we have set out to do in our, in our, in our charter, in our, in, in our processes that we are going through? Are we doing that? How, how do you guys evaluate that? Yeah, you've, you've got it. And um, definitely refer you to uh, the, a literature by Dr. Ellen Fox, um, who is the, the leading authority in this area. And um, she has identified, and it's become a, a hot topic of conversation, uh, that most ethics committees who do consults don't do enough self-evaluation. So they, there's not a, uh, a closed loop of looking at, of the consults we did, what, was, what were the outcomes, not just in terms of what happened to the patient, but were the, was the requester satisfied that their needs were met? Whatever they were, question that was being asked, was it answered? Was there a resolution? Was there satisfaction with the process, the recommendation, the outcome? Francis. Florida Division South Orlando area is that we um the model we use here at Advent Health is actually, a, I, I call it a group model rather than the individual certified ethics model. And I think both, there's literature on both, are great. But what we found is we usually will have a minimum of four people ad hoc from the committee. We have a physician, we have an administrator, then we have, um, we have a chaplain, we have, um, and then we have from the 
choices can be risk management. We have, we have the nurses directly involved, but we always have four from our ethics committee that always join it. And what we found is what's really nice, because I actually do ethics triage and stuff, because I'm thinking, I think, oh, we'll probably end up here. But when you have a group looking at it, looking at the ethics decision-making process, what you come out with, it's a lot richer, because everyone shares their own perspective, from their religious perspective, from their clinical physician perspective, risk from chaplains, from care management. We have a care management person. Um, and we typically have five or six people. We look for a minimum of four. We don't have an ethics consultant list. We have four from our ethics um, committee there. But we found it's a lot richer, and we will look at different perspectives. And so your ethics decision-making process and your recommendations usually come up very different than if one person would have done that. And that's what we have found is helpful. Well said. And speaking of teams doing it, I see Dr. Marla Carter is sitting right next to you. And Dr. Carter is actually the, so pediatrics and perinatal has its own ethics committee, subcommittee of the, the uh, regional uh, ethics committee. And Dr. Carter, you are the clinical co-chair. And Jessica Gallo is the very capable administrative co-chair. She's a director of nursing. Um, and I believe that when you are called to do an ethics consult and you are ramping up in a very, very, you're, you're you're hitting challenging cases that are just amazing, and you're doing good work. Um, any thoughts about how you're, you've constructed your team? Do several people go and do a consult together? or We are a much smaller committee. Uh, so typically, it's the ethics triage person who will reach out to uh, the particular people involved in the case. And then we have an ad hoc uh, meeting. Um, where we come up with our recommendations. Um, but we too went through the six months of bioethics training uh, with Dr. DeLeon and, and Andy, and it was phenomenal um, because I came to the committee without formal training. Uh, I just have an interest. Um, and so it's just as Francis said, you are doing something outside of your comfort zone. Um, I still send my consult notes to Francis and Dr. DeLeon and, and have them read them and give me feedback. So um, it's a process, but it's a very doable process, specifically when your team members are not coming to the table with formal training. Sure. So. Thank you so much. And we we'll to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so a few slides back, um, Andy um, had uh, uh, the um, models of uh, decision making, ethical decision making, uh, that one. Uh, so yeah, here we can, we can talk about this one. So um, I think, Francis, you're um, pointing us to the, uh, the four box method. Um, and um, that's a particularly popular one if you, like me, happen to be um, trained in the case-based uh, approach to ethics. You can cover your ears if you <laughs> object, um, because uh, what uh, my teacher, Dr. Mark Siegler, emphasized um, that uh, it, it was helpful, particularly for physicians, uh, frontline clinicians, um, instead of focusing so much on the principles, you know, that um, uh, Drs. Beecham and Childress are known for, um, and many of you are trained in that tradition, um, and it is perhaps the dominant model out there, um, and uh, the principles of biomedical ethics by Beecham and Childress is one of the Bibles of this field, uh, and yet um, Dr. Siegler and others have said, wait a minute, you know, for docs on the front line, they might find it more helpful to crosswalk those uh, powerful principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice into more actionable um, and hierarchy-driven uh, you know, system. And so there is a four-box model. Uh, we don't have a convenient slide, but believe me, you can Google it anywhere at any time. And that essentially divides up um, the world of ethical decision-making into um, medical facts, right? patient preferences, kind of in the top two quadrants, uh, quality of life, which uh, crosswalks very nicely to um, non-maleficence, among other things, um, and contextual features, by which the, uh, the casuists, uh, as they're called, um, uh, put justice and um, other, other features of the environment and context, right? So without going deeply into that model, because I could uh, keep you all here for hours, um, that's my, Dennis's uh, uh, two-second summary. Say something about the continuum of consultation model, the authoritarian versus yeah. consensus. This yeah, is and, and, but I will let you, since yes, you and you yes, are bursting yes, or something, right. so I don't want to suppress you guys. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much. No, this is it's a really good conversation, I think, and uh, really, like, for me personally, uh, it's a challenge in this model uh, uh, for principles. Principalism is very challenging. I like 
four principles mm -hmm. separately. I don't like them together. <laughs> I definitely don't like them together. And what I found like in uh, our in the ethics meetings, uh, committee meetings, that uh, we have a challenge in to every single person in the committee, yeah. follow them in a different ways. Right. Okay. Now I would like to challenge everyone here, sitting here. Maybe it's a time to develop our principles, yeah. the system principles. Yeah. Maybe it's a time that like we can, if we are talking, like we have already, it's a six, seven bioethics conference that like we have here, maybe really it's a time to develop because I am Eastern Catholic, I have a privilege to work in Adventist healthcare system for six years, and I pretty much from the ethical perspective, I see this principalism, it's not follow the uh, face of Adventist, uh, uh, Adventist faith. It uh, uh, doesn't follow with uh, uh, doctrines, and it doesn't cover all this stuff. And like my point that maybe it's a time to develop other principles for the entire system that will cover really uh, the medical perspective, religious perspective, ethical perspective. And this is, it will be unique system principles and guidance for all of us. I love it. You know, yeah, there, there's a, an old Jewish saying, you know, that um, uh, it's great to read about, um, you know, uh, our people were liberated, uh, you know, in the Exodus. Um, and, um, and yet, if, if it wasn't you that walked through the sea, if you did not internalize, if you did not make that principle yours, then you don't, it's not really, you don't own it, right? It's somebody else's that was just kind of lent to you or given to you. So, yeah, if, if you take the principles and you read about them and you sit in a class with uh, children, so that is one thing. It's quite, quite powerful. But what, how do you make it yours, right? And that means kind of like maybe uh, contextualizing it, depending on what, uh, what your community looks like, what your own problems look like. So very, very helpful. I think you were also bursting with... I know, but I'm not going to write. <laughs> this is too much pressure <laughs> my question i guess is to kind of like pick your brain because what i see you were saying that ethics happens it's always happening yeah but what i run into i am i sit on the apopka campus like yeah. triage you know for ethics um but what i see is that i go on the floors and there's a lot of ethics that should be happening and people are just brushing it off and they're like this is that this is this yeah. and i'm like no 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 let's talk about it this is important yeah. we're talking about a life we're talking about a patient we're talking about their you know their life yeah. and and i see a lot of the team is like they just brush it off and i'm like no 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 we have to s slow down so what are your thoughts on like how do we how should i introduce that effectively i'll let these guys say speak to that as well but my answer would be maybe the first and perhaps most important task of the ethicist is to recognize the ethical issue and help help the person in front of you to name the question and to articulate the question, right? Because you're right, oftentimes the people will just say, well, that's just a length of stay problem. Yeah. That this is a this is a discharge. Well, we just have to identify the LAP. Who is the legally authorized? Mm -hmm. What's the ethical issue at stake, yeah. right? What did this person act? What were their values? And how should their values inform what we do next? Mm -hmm. And in, on the journey to get there, yes, you do have to figure out the LAP because they're going to maybe help you. Um, but really, it's not the LAP you're after. It is respecting the person's own voice, their autonomy, right? That's the goal. Um, on the way there, you have some instrumental steps you've got to take. Um, so the education that we did for peds and perinatal, the education we did for East Orlando, covers, uh, you know, uh, a little bit, you're getting a little taste of what that education looks like over a, typically a six-month period we found is what we need. Um, one of the things you'll learn, especially if you go through ASBH uh, ethics consultant certification, is that um, th you can think of um, ethics consultation as a, on a continuum between two extremes. One is um, the authoritarian approach. This is where an expert you know, comes to you, they might airdrop into your environment, your situation, and they will, you know, expertly assess your situation and it will render a, um, you know, a, a, a recommendation. They will tell you what your ethical issue you're struggling with and this is the answer or here's a range of answers perhaps. And then on the other end of the continuum, the continuum is the extreme 
that ASBH calls the pure consensus model, and that's essentially rejecting or keeping at arm's length the notion of expert or expertise and saying, you know what, <clears throat> no, no, we've got to get agreement by everybody. You've got to use your own ethics, ethical conscience and your own voice, and um, everyone's got to be heard from, and we've got to craft a consensus that includes everything and everybody. So we're not so much driven by what is the, the, <clears throat> the truthfulness of the expert principles, right? And they recommend, as you can imagine, um, that Solomonic middle, right, where uh, no, it's not pure consensus, and it's not authoritarian either. It is what they call the, the uh, facilitated ethics process, where we actually do listen to the experts. We do uh, weigh in on the principles, um, but how do the principles apply here, right now, in this case? Not that case there or that case, but this case right here, right? And that's kind of the marriage of the um, casuistry and the principles, if you will. Um, and you'll learn that when you do your ethics uh, consultant certification. Just a few seconds, and maybe I can speak from, from my experience and with our ethics committee, because we had to start right where we were. We had to work with what we, what we knew, and going back to the needs assessment, we realized that a lot of what we were seeing reoccurring is end of life. And so what we did is we actually used an SBAR script, and if, Carl, uh, if Mark was here, he'd be happy to know that I'm not just going to say SBAR script and assume that you know what I'm saying, um, but it was the situational background assessment uh, recommendation uh, kind of format that we used so that we could send to the other clinicians and say, this is kind of the two focuses, emphasis that we're going to work along these reoccurring issues. And that was end of life and non-surrogate decision maker because of the type of clientele of patients that we were getting. So that gave us a scope and framework in which we can operate out of where we felt comfortable um, until we get to, to where we want to be. Um, yeah, so uh, a question, but also just a little background of, of my context. So right now where I'm working, there's four full-time ethicists, and our model is, is it, you know, there's a delicate line that I think we're balancing um, because what we've struggled with in some ways is how do we, how do we express our role in such a way that we, we're, we take an advisory role, right? Like this is our recommendation. You don't have to take it. Um, but I think there's some circumstances that we end up discovering or something that other people need to be involved, like, peer, you know, it goes to peer review, there's professionalism issues or risk management needs to be involved. And so I think my question is, how do you, you know, embody this role in such a way that you're communicating that we are here to support you, we're here to support patient, family, staff, we're not the ethics police, we're not here to get you in trouble, even though we have relationships, right, with all of these administrative stakeholders. Um, how do you facilitate that kind of messaging? I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Daly, and I'll take 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, I would say recognize those other disciplines that need to be involved. Francis, how many times do we say, you know what, um, this needs to go to risk? You know, an origami report needs to have. Um, how many times do we say, you know, that is a very important issue. It needs to go to peer review, right? So, um, and in fact, there's a process called ethics triage that attempts systematically to do exactly what you just laid out. What you're already doing, ethics happens where ethics happens, what you're already doing, you know, on a, on a small scale, um, we try to do on an uh, organized larger scale by ethics triage. And we'd, I'd say of um, 10 cases that come to us, as ethics consult requests, maybe how many? Well, because we require ethics, because um, we refer things to chaplains, to care management, to risk, to to even medical staff leadership, just depending to our professional, just depending the issue. What we actually did, we did a study of our ethics consults, and we found that 81% of all our ethics consults were due to communication issues. So what we did from when we found that out, we actually require, when we have an ethics consult, we require that there be a physician, meaning physicians, and the legally authorized person and influential others, a sit-down meeting. And we found that most of our um, ethics consults get resolved in the physician's family conference. And we only have, like, probably two out of ten. Yeah. So there you go, right? So the, what, what you're describing very eloquently is really, we can call it ethics triage or triaging of requests that come in as ethics consults, requests that really, like, eight out of 10, go elsewhere, right, and are resolved in, by other means. Dr. 
Dr. Winslow. <laughs> well, I, d I want to first of all thank all of you. Uh, we still have a little time um, for such a rich presentation, and also those of you who are contributing from different yeah. places. You remember that little kid in the back of the classroom in first grade or whatever, always had his hand up? <laughs> that that would have been me. And uh, you know, I, said, I know, call on me. I've, I've stifled myself to, to not do that, so th I didn't put my hand up. I do want to say this. I, thank you for recognizing that there are different approaches that work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we did come up to write out, and uh, we're proud of you, Francisco, what you're doing. What would work in write out? wouldn't work, as you know, in Loma Linda, you're talking about vastly different sets of resources. So being a little bit pragmatic about, I saw that word earlier, being a little bit practical about what have you got to work with, and then doing the best you can. And when it comes to the all these different isms, like principalism and so forth, I, I just want to make this comment. It's not like a, the football teams in the NFL or something like, you can join up with the Cowboys. Or you can do, no, it's not like that. We're all playing the game, right? And, and these all represent different ways of, they're different wisdom traditions. Right. So when you put those four principles up there, and we all salute, um, think of those as considerations. I thought Dr. Hamilton did a great job by translating them a couple of times today to saying, well, okay, you're talking about justice? Well, simple fairness, Are you, is, is it being fair? Right. Uh, you can get this into language people can understand. So that's just a little comment for me about not, not imagining, well, I'm a principalist or I'm not. Um, all of us take those things into consideration. Are you telling the truth? Uh, is it fair? Are you doing more harm than good? We can get this into ordinary speech, and I think one of the jobs that all of us who kind of develop a bibliography and ethics should take as a professional responsibility is to get the language into the, the language that's used in the hallways and in those lounges. If we can't do that, we're, we're talking to each other and nobody else. Well said, well said. Um, I can't resist, you know, the NFL metaphor. Um, and you're right, we are not, in fact, all split up on different teams. Um, you know, but there, there is a Tom Brady, um, you know, at a very different level from most others. And if we had a Tom Brady in clinical ethics, it might be Gerald Winslow. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. We have just a, a, a few more uh, minutes. I'm going to uh, what we call an academic speed. Just run through the slide really, really quickly. The goal of ethics education is to move beyond uh, the ethics committee into the larger community. One of the functions or one of the roles of uh, ethics committee is to provide uh, eth ethics education to the broader, to the larger hospital mm -hmm. community. Community. This gets at your question. So, and Dr. Winslow just said it so well. The role of those of us who do professional ethics is to help the community use that language and so hey then you go into the hallway have you thought about it this way you push them a little bit on that but the role of uh, at least in the literature of ethics committees is to provide some broader ethics education within the hospital context uh, as well as provide some ethics education for the larger community that we're serving out there in the world. And so they recommend doing some of these kinds of things, the ethics grands, grand rounds. Wow. We would do them monthly at Loma Linda, if I'm remembering carefully, uh, uh, Dr. Winslow. But you can, you can read them. You can imagine the kinds of things you can do just to make ethics a part of the larger discourse that's happening in the community, to let the community know that this is what we're about. We should be talking about these things. We should be taking the issues uh, seriously. In the literature, they talk about creating a climate for ethics. And I think that's what we're trying to capture in the slide. We're going to reserve the rest of the time for any questions that you may have or comments that you want to make. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Ganell. I'm from Hinsdale Hospital. I'm a family doc. Uh, Dr. Lemkin and I had had some email communication. Yes. My The docs that come to the ethics committee in my hospital want to know, am I going to be legally covered when I decline to provide the ivermectin, the feudal care, perhaps to, to the point of ECMO that Loma Linda experienced? 
And my understanding in some situations is that legal will say, do the right thing and we'll back you up. And some of my colleagues have not felt backed up. Mm -hmm. We haven't really experienced the legal muscle. At Hinsdale, we were fortunate to have Father Grogan, who was an attorney, as well as an ethicist. And he was the archdiocese big person. And I mean no offense to Catholics. I'm, I'm not a Catholic, and so I don't know the labels. But he was, he was way up in the hierarchy. And he provided us with really robust legal muscle to help, help docs feel that we weren't going to be hung out to dry when the legal legals decided that maybe this wasn't in the best interest of the hospital's reputation. So what, what docs need is legal support that's robust, that's consistent with our values of the hospital of healing, and, and we're not seeing it as much as we'd like. So on your ethics committee, please have an attorney that is responsible to the hospital. And please, please don't call me a provider. <laughs> please don't call me a provider. Please recognize me as a physician. Thanks. Thank Any other questions? I know we're, we are up for time. I see one more comment. Yeah. Um, because a little bit of what you were saying touches on the theme of also demoralization. You know, as far as physicians, when they don't feel that maybe they can take any action, but they are clearly responsible for the patient's care, but they don't feel like they have the legal support or the support in general. And so that leads to the subject of demoralization and burnout tremendously. And another way that I see that exacerbated as related to the ethics triage is a lot of the times cases never escalate to this beautiful mm -hmm. ethics consultation because they get eliminated out the gate by policy says, it's the LAP, or legally, that's really the only course. So you never get the opportunity to have this robust and incredible coming together of minds, and that is tremendously demoralizing. Now, in the interest of positive reframe, <laughs> case conferences and ethics grand rounds afford people involved in these cases to have that alleviation of that burnout, to get to process the cases in the way that would have happened had there been a formal consult. And I know for me, that's something that I wish we did more of that because, I mean, throughout all those ECMO cases, literally every one of them, if we had had ethics grand rounds, that would have, the, the showing of people for that alone, you know, to, to experience, just getting to process and normalize, like this was ethically difficult and, and all of that. So I really, since we all do care about burnout in this field, if we could, if nothing else, promote ethics grand rounds and continued education in our institutions, because that might alleviate a lot. Have you used Schwartz rounds? Yes, okay. but I haven't seen, you know, with the pandemic as well, everything's on Teams, sure. you already know, but I haven't seen one that said ethics that use these frameworks and everything we do in the in the ethics committee meeting okay. you know, in a long time. And it, yeah. it just seems like it would be a great opportunity. Yeah. For emotional closure of yeah. a very, um, you know, um, moral distress or emotional distress in your staff, um, whole person care rounds or Schwartz rounds are sometimes, we don't have them on our list there, Andy, but maybe we should, you know, um, that's a, a very powerful tool. I work for a very um, ethics oriented uh, organization and we have the principle established in our hospital or in the hospital that I work for no ethics consult is stupid enough you can ha call for a gut feeling yeah. and it can the janitor the nurse the family the patient the physician anybody can call and we react within two hours and uh, I'm one of the consultants, and so we sit there and we connect all the pieces. Our role is to go and connect the pieces, and then we bring it together, we make a consensus, uh, and we do do briefing. So when we have new nurses come into the hospital, they get a training in ethics. When we have new physicians come to the hospital, they get a training in ethics. I would recommend it. I know we have gotten into the lunchtime, and if I learned anything in my younger years, you don't take the time away from the saints to eat their meals. And so we want to do that, but I want to leave you with these quick three questions as we land this. Where are you? What are you doing? 
and where do you want to be? Because I believe that all of us are already involved in these conversations. You are that advocate. We are that advocate. That's what we're doing. And it's all for this idea of ethics of hope, that we become hope for the hopeless. So thank you to our presenters. Thank you to you all for being Have a wonderful day.